Hope's Hollow, a fantasy adventure, written by A.R. Knight. Part 1. Misfits and Murder. Chapter 1. Breakout. The first arrow flew and the guards fled. The shot zipped in from the saggy willows where a thousand shadows might hold the shooter, that the driver and hired hand next to him on the carriage's front bench were transporting nothing of value added to the quick decision. The pair jumped on the leading two horses in a dexterous display that defied their heavy red cloaks, released the reins as a second arrow burrowed into the carriage side and shouted their mounts into muddy flight. There was no third arrow. Instead, shadows emerged slow from the willows and reeds. Buzzing bugs and a few miserable birds followed their approach. Ragged boots squelching in ground left soft by an early spring thaw. Hands dashed from sleeves, signals sending the attackers into a wide circle around the carriage. Their object, a prisoner's transport, sat squat and sodden, what had been bright wood now dark and speckled with nature's branding. A single door waited at its back, barred with heavy black iron. While what waited inside was a question, a guaranteed reward sat on top. Trunks stuffed with potential sat, bounded in twine, and those crates prompted snapped conversation between the approaching bandits. Guesses as to what waited inside and to whom it would go. Blind hope brought blades into grips, prompted two scrawny fleeter thieves to leap onto the carriage's front. First to the treasure, had the best chance to slip something away, something that might earn a way out of this soggy hell. The leader, the only one whose short sword wasn't pocked with decay, made his grizzled way towards the barred door. The man kept the blade low, point ready to raise should the situation require it, but prisoners made good recruits. They'd have hate that needed nursing, rage that needed wetting. Maybe, with a few more hands, they could raid Hope's Hollow itself. The bandit leader was right on two of those counts. A lackey, fresh pipeweed lit to celebrate the easy victory, approached the bar and, at the leader's behest, made to slide it free. Knife work above, coupled with snarky curses as the trunks were discovered to have locks disguised a particular noise, a few clinks and clacks that might have had the bandit leader reconsidering his decision. Alas, victory took its price. The bar slid back, the lackey pulled open the door, and as the swinging wood went by, a crystal clear icicle jutted through the bandit's chest. The sparkling tip, not catching any sun amid the clouded afternoon, nonetheless glittered before the bandit leader's open mouth. The lackey fell aside dead before he joined the mosses and mud, and with his fall, the killer revealed herself. Worn rags did nothing to disguise her menace, a skin the colour of bleached sky and patterned like the snow that only rarely fell around this swamp. Her outstretched hand reached through the opening, finger pointing at the bandit leader, passing some fell judgment. He stumbled back, croaked out a call to arms, Fire swallowed it whole. Get yourself moving, sweetie, gnashed the furry cackler at Drasher's left, as the flame wave left Siln's hand blazing back the bandits. Your dessert, and it's too early for that. Drasher fumbled at the rope around his waist, the curling blade at its end. That he was trying to make some sense of the situation at the same time didn't help his rise a tottering advance buttressed by the rock-like monster across from him. The creature didn't say a word as it caught Drasher on a single slate shoulder, only uttered a guttural grunt as it threw him forward towards the open door. Siln, proving she had more sense than her former captor, slid to her right and let Drasher tumble out the carriage's back door. He landed on a soft, not-quite-sunken bandit body. The uneven footing put him in a bad spot as a bandit charged in from the left, mouth foaming from the devil's delight all too common around here. Drasher's ill-honed instincts took over and he twitched the rope and its blade towards the dagger-wielding danger, 
slipping on the body's sodden cloak at the same time. The strike lacked everything a crimson guard ought to deploy, the blade lodging lightly in the bandit's thigh. No entangling rope, no severing cut. The dagger and its feverish wielder bore down on Drasher, only to be wiped away by a living landslide. The rock creature rolled from the carriage, barreling into the bandit in a stone wash. Drasher pulled on his rope blade as the bandit vanished under rocks, the creature reforming from its rubble into one, two, three pounding fists. An arrow flew in, struck the stone monster, bounced off. Now see, that's a proper way to enter a fight, said the cackler, jumping down next to Drasher. Castus's wide, fanged grin only grew as it reached to the icicled corpse at his feet. And look at this! Weapons! For me! Stop talking and start killing. Siln, her voice everything a babbling brook wasn't, said as she joined the others on the ground. Her hands glimmered with fire and ice, a purpose unknown, till Drasher heard arrows slamming into frozen spots, sticking in the air around them as if locked in time. If I get tired, we're all dead. Oh, now let's not get rash. The cackler, daggers secured, flipped one into the air. As its hilt found his palm, Castus launched it, the blade flying straight, true and far too long to make its new home in an archer's throat. These poor fools have made a miserable mistake. A coarse, scraping sound overhead drew Drasher's eyes above, where a heavy trunk teetered over the edge. Its bulk swung their way, drawing a warning from the crimson guard. He dropped the rope blade, braced his feet and thrust, his arms up over the cackler's head. The trunk hit hard, its weight bending his knees, getting a grunt, but no more from Drasher. Hold it there, Siln said, and Drasher felt a sudden heat by his head, a candle lit too close. A flash made Drasher wince, a narrow orange-red line burning through the trunk and scorching the peering bandits beyond. Cowls burst alight, curious snipes turning to howling curses. The trunk, too, caught flame, and Drasher bent, threw it behind him into the muck. The burning bulk broke open, revealing clothes, weapons, gear exiled along with its owners. Siln, if you've burned my axes, I swear... The cackler started before the sorcerer cut him off. Killing, Castus. That's what you're good at. Do it. Ah, you're no fun. Castus cut back, but he jumped at the carriage's back, those hands springing narrow claws and climbing quick. Another scream drew Drasher back towards the swampy forest. Behind several trees, the thick foliage shook once, twice, then settled as a body flew free into a far-off tree. The rock monster tromped after it, a pointless path of vengeance disrupted when another arrow, another terrible mistake, clacked into its side. The shooter, a slight bandit hiding behind a blue cloak near another tree, found their next arrow without a target, as the rock monster dissipated into whirling dust. As Drasher retrieved his rope blade, slung it around his shoulder, that dust reformed near the poor archer. Stone hands gripped the bandit's neck, and they did not let go. They're running, Siln said. Her truth was verified by Castus's wild jeers, followed by more thrown knives. At least one, going by the screams, found its mark. Drasher, though, found his attention held on Siln, and the collar he suddenly wished was still around her neck. She noticed, and the dancing fire of her eyes focused on him. Behind and around her, bodies lay strewn amid a muck that had reclaimed them within the week. As promised, Siln said, you have your life. Now we get ours. Chapter 2. Campfire Cackles The gig offered decent pay, a chance for provisions and coin outside the filthy slums Drasher had called home. A lifetime amid squalor, stealing and being stolen from taught hard scrabble lessons, and when he'd hit ten, a local gang leader with a penchant for violence had taken Drasher under his wing, leading Enough already, 
Siln said, her blue, gilded skin flashing against the campfire. I don't need your life story. Castus asked for it, Drasher replied. I thought it would be more interesting, said the cackler, picking some small bird's bones out of his teeth with a bloodied dagger. More murder, less tragedy. Tragedy, Siln scoffed. I watched my whole realm melt before my eyes. That's tragedy. The trio, Agram had curled itself into a rocky ball beneath a nearby willow to wait out the night, sat on several mossy stones and decaying logs. After looting the carriage and the bandit bodies, a sordid task that Castus took to with much pleasure, the cackler then suggested they get moving. They were days yet from Hope's Hollow, the fetid wart that was their intended destination. So every minute dawdling was one wasted. Castus also suggested they ditch the crumbling road and its likely conflicts for a swampy shortcut, a boast made against the furry killer's impeccable sense of direction. One drasher was beginning to doubt. Now, with little save scraggly trees, smoky marsh, and seemingly endless mosquitoes pestering their every move, the band had settled in for what promised to be a miserable night. Your realm? Drasher asked. I thought you all came from that place down south. What's it called? Fosina, and that's what I'm saying. It's gone. Gone? Castus laughed. Siln makes it sound like it was an accident. The woman glared so hard Frost formed between the two, melting into a tiny spitting rain over the fire. Don't be sour, Castus replied, spitting out the last of the bones into the murk. You did it to yourselves, always trying to see who get the biggest fire and look what happens. Doesn't mean it's not a tragedy, Siln muttered. What really? Drasher asked. You burned down your whole country? Realm, I said. Several countries. All gone. Castus laughed again, a wet chuckle that matched the swamp's humid air. Worse than what happened here, even. The ash coated everything for days. Siln glowered, stared at the flame and said nothing. How did I not hear about this? Drasher asked. It's not like... Three hundred years ago, mate, Castus said. That's why you little humans don't remember. Hell, your buggy bands have about resettled the place. Something I'm sure Sillin's thrilled about. Lifespans were such a problem. Would that everyone lived on a human scale, fit and ready by fifteen, likely dead by forty. After five years slinging the bladed rope for the Crimson Guard, Drasher figured he'd be well ready to lie in the dirt in another couple decades. Preferably, though, dirt that wasn't so wet and wormy. Can't do anything about the pests, Sillen said, then blinked. Castus, what did you mean, here, what happened here? Castus sighed, shook his furry head. A bandit's cap, woefully undersized, covered a patchy scalp between the cackler's ears. Coupled with a janky mix of cloak and stolen too small tunic, Castus looked like he belonged in a dingy circus outfit. Then again, Drasher's own uniform had holes and stank worse than the dung pit he'd called home for far too long. So who was he to criticise? It's why I'm guessing your morons wanted to send us here, Castus said, pointed a clawed finger at Drasher. Hope's hollows the new life after disaster. Another laugh, sharp and barking. The cackler did that a lot, something Drasher was realising with growing dismay. Bunch of wizards like Fosina. Or maybe it was an invention gone wrong. Hard to say, but all this swamp came from that mistake. Thing is, there's a lot of good stuff buried out in this muck. Treasure, opportunity. What those bandits were looking for, Siln guessed. Right, I'm thinking we were the snack for a real main course. What stuff? Drasher asked. Oh, I think we'll find some soon enough, Castus said. 
Agram's picked up a word from some stone not far off. We'll meet it in the morning. Drasher and Sillen both pressed Castus for more, and the guard even threw a word or two at Agram's rocky ball. But the cackler claimed no more knowledge, and Agram remained silent as a stone. And so, after finishing some mangy bread and some dried jerky taken from the carriage's stores, Drasher tossed his cloak over the log he'd been sitting on and laid down near the fire. Siln took three steps away, snapped her fingers, and encased herself in an ice diamond. Castus climbed the nearby willow, leaving Drasher alone near the dying flames. Compared to the rusty grime and constant noise of the city he'd lived in for so long, sleep in the buggy marsh didn't come easy. Too quiet, too curious. A particular word Castor used kept battering around Drasher's would-be dreams. One that blotted out the awful decision to sign the Crimson Guard contract, bringing him all the way up here. Treasure. Agram didn't so much lead as rumble, expecting the other three to follow in its considerable wake. The rock creature lumbered through the early morning until, after barging through a copse of sickly bushes, it stood before a sinking mausoleum. That word and its implication of bodies within seemed appropriate to Drasher as the building, somewhat smaller than a house, had a solitary spike emerging upward from a battered door. One looked to have been broken and remade at least once. The spike, green after what must have been years of decay in the marsh, still bore unknown sigils dancing around its circular body. It bled into an ornate, if stilted, metal frame around the door. Really? Siln said, crossing her ice-coated arms. Drasher wasn't sure if the scaled pattern covering the woman's body really was ice, but he'd long since decided not to ask. This is where you're leading us? Oh, like you're not tempted, Castor said. Nice work, Agram. This is exactly what we need. I'm not going in. Drasher glanced Siln's way. What? Why not? Because I know what's going to be in there, that's why. Agram grumbled, turned its baleful black-eyed gaze towards Siln. She flicked her finger at the rock monster, sending tiny sparks blasting into its face. If they bothered Agram, the thing didn't show it. Siln, the cackler said. Agram's got it right. We're destitute, dearie, and this here's the best way to right our wrong accounts. Put us on the up and up when we hit Hope's Hollow. We could be kings and queens, you know. Or we could be dead, Sillen snapped back. That's quite the spread, Drasher added. Oh, she's just being boring. Castus put a clawed hand on Agram's shoulder. The rock beast grumbled again, somehow sounding like a massive purring cat. With this guy here, my brace of knives, and your... The cackler's eyes fell to the rope blade. Thing. We'll be fine. We'd be finer if Siln joined us. But if she's not feeling like earning her portion, well, more for the rest of us. Siln scowled, rolled her frosted eyes skyward, then shrugged. Okay. But when this turns ugly, don't expect me to save your sorry asses. Wouldn't dream of it, Snow, Castus said then tapped Agram's shoulder, pointed to the door. Mind leading the way, my bolder buddy. A groom did not mind. A lumbering shoulder charge snapped the door off its decrepit hinges and sent it sliding down the mossy stairs beyond, a descent longer than Drasher would have expected given the mausoleum's size. Agram, though, showed no concern, continued to plod right on forward down into the dark. If you'd be so kind, Castus said to Sillen, afraid I left my torch back home. Another eye roll, another sigh, but Sillen snapped her left fingers. A bright flame sprang up in her palm, and they all stepped off after Agram. As daylight disappeared behind him, replaced with the mausoleum's dripping gloom, Drasher followed Sillen's dancing flame and tried tried so very hard to ignore the deep dread growing in his gut. Chapter 3 Deep Down
Ah, the many charms of a mausoleum. On the left, mouldering vines and dripping swamp water. To the right, bones of small creatures who snuck in but couldn't find their way out. Old braziers long buried under spider webs loomed along the walls, while the steps unleashed dusty clouds so large any visiting soul would be hard-pressed to breathe. Drasher, however, did, and so pronounced the party's arrival at the mausoleum's centre with a rousing sneeze. Agram, two steps ahead, every rocky stride leaving a scarred divot in the ground, grumbled at the sound. Siln, holding their sole torch in her left palm, repeated her most favoured expression, the sigh. Castor slapped Drasher on the back and walked by the crimson guard, idly cutting through dangling webs with a dagger. For all that, Drasher sneezed again. This time the others merely pressed on. Siln's orange glow revealed a tomb belonging to far more than the riffraff Drasher knew. There were archways for one, six of them, branching off on either side, each marked by corroded plaques. The crumbling stone amid the arches didn't inspire much confidence in the mausoleum's ability to withstand the swamp's advances for long. But Drasher kept his misgivings quiet, mostly because Castus's sudden laughter would have drowned any other words. The cackler honoured his species with the wild, hooting chuckles, standing in the great room's centre as he did so. Siln put her non-burning hand to her head, whispered something to herself that Drasher couldn't hear. Agrum regarded Castus with a stone's implacable stare. What are you doing? Drasher finally asked when Castus slowed his laughter to take a breath. What's so funny? While I can understand your appreciation for my humour, dear guard, Castus replied, drawing a second dagger and holding both at the ready. For once there is nothing to laugh at. Instead, I am setting a trap. A trap? For who? Why, for them. Castus pointed with his dagger towards the nearest archway, one just to Agram's left. What had been empty before now held a hulking, slobbering form, a human, albeit one far, far away from its original form, green, blotted with blue and purple bruises, as if its decay had been halted at just the right moment for true awfulness, the thing lurched towards Agram with a burbling rasp rising from its mouth. That rasp found its echo from the other archways, all but one filling with more drooling terrors. See, Drasher, Castor said, it's far easier to kill the dead when you have room to fight them. Drasher swore under his breath, unslinging the rope blade and twisting towards the closest corpse. The fumbling, fetid creature stumbling towards him resembled a small woman, a single scraggly black hair stuck across her face. Another unfortunate soul followed her, their arms outstretched towards Drasher's admittedly large throat. His mother had made sure the young Drasher received almost all the food they could find, and that benefited more than the man's imposing physique. It gave him the strength to fling his rope blade at the she-corpse, striking the miserable thing square in the chest. The blow would have slaughtered any normal target, but here only gave Drasher a healthy coating of bile and worse. Fighting off a wretch, Drasher yanked hard on the rope blade, felt the knife at its end tear free. Felt, too, the first grasps of cold, long dead hands. Drasher snapped his right arm back, drawing the rope blade into a loop across his wrist. Around and around, as Drasher's left arm kept the she-corpse at precarious bay, the blade tightened until the taut rope made it as much a claw as anything Drasher could hope to wield. He jammed his right hand forward, pushing aside the she-corpse's grasping hands to deliver a bisecting blow to his foe's neck. The creature fell backward, evicting a rattling moan that, to Drasher, so drenched in offal, sounded something like a thank you. He had no, you're welcome, to offer in reply, as the next corpse was upon him. Drasher struck out again with the knife, this time burying it in a larger blubbery bicep. The dead man matched Drasher in height and must have a triplet Drasher's weight, a wobbly bulk that crashed into Drasher and bore him to the floor. Foul air fled Drasher's lungs in a rush, 
an eye-searing sip-on of energy from his limbs, to the ether. Drasher's arms, both with blade and without, were pinned to the stone floor. His legs were little better, feet capable of a twitch and little more. Of Drasher's remaining weapons, only his teeth availed themselves for use, but his target crawled with literal maggots, and Drasher resolved then and there to die before biting into the putrid body. Castus had no need for such resolutions. The cackler welcomed his summoned dead with one throw after another, every dagger from his stolen brace finding itself buried in a rotted skull. The twice-slain corpses tumbled as he struck, rolling their broken selves towards Castus, who would pluck the spent dagger from its slotted roost and sling it again. All throughout, the cackler whistled a tune, one which Drasher, if he hadn't been crushed beneath a corpse, might have recognised as a ditty common in the ratty ruins of his childhood. If the cackler preferred knife work, Agrum employed blunter methods. The rock monster took its archway at a run, lowering its shoulder and mashing the corpse in the entry into the ones behind. Amid their wretched writhing masses, Agrum flung its stone fists and boulder-block legs, rendering the ghouls into so much goo. Those corpses that closed with the creature found some success in dragging the rock man down, pulling Agrum towards the ground. That momentary victory proved hollow, as Agrum found friendship with the mausoleum's bricked floor, the blocks themselves swallowing Agrum, only to spit it out again a few strides distant, ready to recommence the mashing. Siln followed a less obvious path, withdrawing back up the mausoleum's stairs, though not so far as to doom her forced friends to darkness. Instead, she invited five rotted hulks after her, then washed the stairs in ice to send the mindless pursuers into a hapless slide. Grouped at the stair's bottom, their shambled limbs a hideous collection, Siln held her torch up to her mouth and gave it a blow. The searing wind found its swift way down those steps, touched the piled corpses, and found ready fuel amid their dried skin and hollow bones. True fire burst forth and devoured the undead, leaving a black ash pile after mere seconds. Satisfied, Siln descended, her every step banishing the ice as her blue-scaled feet touched down. Her view upon re-entry found Castus retrieving his daggers one by one, the cackler licking them clean. Agrum wasn't in view, though the squelching sounds to her left suggested the rock monster was still having his fun. Not quite so joyful, though, was the crimson guard to the right. Drasher groaned beneath a truly massive corpse, one whose blubber lay sprawled across the man like plague's blanket. The corpse itself no longer moved of its own accord. Acastus dagger jutted from the thing's head, but jerked as Drasher struggled to free himself. Is that all of them? Siln asked the cackler. The dead, in my experience, don't play games, Castus said, joining Siln near Drasher's struggling form. The cackler reached down, yanked out his last dagger. I imagine this mausoleum is now ours for the looting. Split equally? You would remove the game? Castus laughed. Drasher cursed. No, Siln, this is a contest. We find what we find trade among ourselves. To the best go the spoils. Siln sniffed, smiled. Agreed. Hey! Drasher wheezed at their feet. Help! Both Siln and Castus stared down at the man. Behind them, Agram stomped free from its arch, soaked in unknown juices, dangling bits, and bone chips. Together, the three exchanged glances. It was left again to Siln to sigh. I suppose it's only fair, Siln said, flicking her hand towards the body crushing Drasher. A gust both mighty and minuscule shot through the mausoleum, finding its focus on the corpse and ripping it off the crimson guard. The body, like some clock's handle flipping the hours, tottered up and over, to land with a dust scattering thud. Drasher gasped, drew in his first breath in what seemed like hours, and sneezed. And that, I think, kicks us off, Castus said. May the best treasure hunter win.
Chapter 4 Rags and Riches Castus danced left through the closest open archway. Behind him, Drasher, sneezing yet again, rose slow to unsteady feet. Agram grumbled, the rock monster's lack of interest in any treasure only improving the cackler's odds. Siln dashed off the opposite way, snowflakes dancing from her every footfall. She was the greatest danger to Castus's greedy ambitions, but Siln lacked physical strength, and going by the stone coffins spread before Castus, strength would be needed. The chamber didn't spread far in any direction, a fact Castus glimpsed before Siln's retreat doused the area in darkness. No matter, if his bets were right, a simple shift of a stone lid would give him options. With his daggers bouncing against his chest, the cackler's vaunted axes had indeed been melted in the carriage battle by the careless Siln, an unfortunate event. Castus reached the first coffin, planted his furred and clawed hands against the lid and shoved. With a scraping sound, the lid shifted and dead air wheezed free. The hoped for light didn't emerge. Instead, only a whiff of matted decay and dying hope. The second one gave much the same result, and this time Castus issued a curse. For once, his intuition seemed to have led them astray. A fumbling return to the central chamber and its corpse collection confirmed similar results from Drasher and Siln. Only bones, and not many of them either. It's like they stole the bodies, Drasher said, shivering beneath his crimson guard uniform, the motley thing a shredded mess, more bile and blotch than respectable cloth. They, Siln asked, whomever looted our find before us. Castus frowned, clacking claws against one another. The cackler, chasing new intuition, this one faultless in its freshness, spun and knelt next to the corpse Siln had blown off Drasher minutes earlier. The question as to who that might have been, and therefore who has the treasure we ought to own, lies with this body here. Say what? Drasher asked. Look at this poor soul. What rags remain upon its body are sodden and ruined, yes, but do they look like the stuff of legend? Castus asked, his sharp voice bouncing around the mossy, overgrown stone. Not so. Rather like the pathetic, miserable masses to me. If I hazard a guess, the others will be much the same. Which means? These abominations were not the ill-fated denizens of this morgue, my dim-witted friend. These were planted here by whomever came and took the real treasure. Drasher glanced at Siln, who, keeping her arms folded, glared at Castus. Get to the point, Cackler. A delightful trap, one set for treasure hunters gone awry. If indeed I had to peg a possibility, it's that we've wandered into a net for something far more nefarious than a few corpses. Castus grinned around the group, drawing confusion from Drasher, Siln's flat stare, and Agram's inscrutable stone face. See, it's a simple plot. Leave a mausoleum open to the greedy masses, let a few corpses destroy their hapless souls, then come by later and loot what's left, like a farm for fools. If that's the case, then they're probably watching the door we destroyed, and we need to get out of here, Drasher said, starting for the stairs. No, Siln said, and Castus laughed. The frosted woman understood. They trapped us, now it's our turn. The Crimson Guard offered Drasher little in the way of training. They tossed him a cloak several days' time in a ramshackle barracks near a fallow field on Felonine's outskirts and let him flail around with the rope blade. That they kept Drasher fed and in a real bed immediately made it the best experience of his life. Angling for the worst, even above fending away rats in the filthy camps boarding Felenin's gilded walls, was waiting around the mausoleum for someone to come get murdered. Drasher's companions offered little for amusement. Agram took out its boredom on the remaining stone coffins, rumbling from one to the next and bashing them all to bits. Drasher couldn't be sure, but the rock monster seemed to eat some of those pieces too, crunching those up in its toothless granite maw. 
Siln had Drasher and Castus gather the moss and mouldering corpse bodies into a pile before setting it alight, providing an awful, yet consistent, source of light and heat. This done, she retreated to a corner and, like covering herself in a blanket, drew an ice cocoon over herself. Wake me when they're coming, Sillan said as the barrier slid atop her. Even Castus, prone to long-winded rambles of no consequence, fell into a meditative silence. The cackler took out his knives one by one, attacking any nicks and dull edges with a whetstone pilfered from one of those bandits. That the daggers themselves, similarly looted from those cowled looters, were in rough shape and had no chance of being rescued from their dire straits by a simple sharpening stone. In a tomb, didn't seem to matter. Drasher watched all this while fighting off further sneezes and pondering, yet again. What had gone so wrong in his life? To bring him here. The Crimson Guard offered little help. Its sole ethos was to take on contracts, deliver them, and earn coin that might trickle down to the poor souls, making up its disparate ranks. There weren't rules for situations like this, weren't magical beacons or enchantments Drasher could call upon to bring aid crashing to his side. The two companions who'd fled at the bandits' first attack had only met Drasher a week before, when they'd declared Drasher would be stuffed in the carriage to keep an eye on their prisoner cargo. As the youngest, the newest, Drasher had no power and no say, so he'd relented, and in turn spent hours and days enduring Siln's glare and Castus's endless tales. All to wind up here, where he'd probably end as one of those damn corpses, shambling about this ruin, waiting for the next batch of morons. The ugly loop played itself around and around Drasher's mind as he watched the rotten flames, and he fell so far into his circular damnation that he didn't notice the approaching steps until a groom grumbled. Wake the Ice Queen, Castus whispered near Drasher's ear. Then sit in the middle of the room. They'll come for you, and that's when we take them. I'm the bait? The weakest one's always the bait, Drasher. Don't take offence. Be proud. Drasher did take offence, but could do little with it, as Castus and Agram disappeared quick into the side chambers. Making a mental note to deliver a series of harsh opinions to Castus, should his next life as a wandering corpse fail to occur. Drasher did, as the cackler asked. He rapped on Sillan's ice cloak, which melted just enough to reveal the woman's tired, frosted eyes, and said intruders approached. In a wet flash, Siln's ice became a puddle, and she brushed by Drasher to disappear to his right, leaving the crimson guard alone in the centre room. He didn't wait long, though the first face down the stairs didn't match what Drasher expected. For one, it wasn't a face, but a rickety, pale skull. Beneath it stretched a spine and, attached to that, a ribcage, arms and legs, all in their marrow perfection. Anatomy wasn't Drasher's a subject, but growing up in Felenin's rancid outskirts gave a boy plenty of chances to see bones, both in and outside their natural confines. Still, Drasher gulped. The skeleton held a crude black iron blade in its bony grip. Behind it came another, this one wielding a wood cudgel. The pair clacked into the room, keeping their void stares on Drasher. Behind them cowled came two more figures, at least seeming human, though the frigid pallor of their visible hands and noses suggested a lifetime hidden from the sun. Two more skeleton servants follow, rounding out the sextet. Just you, asked the first cowled one, voice a withered wind. Just you defeated all that we left behind. Drasher put on his best grin and shrugged. The rope blade hung off his right hand, ready. The bait prepared to strike. Chapter 5 The Cowled Ones The cult wasn't something you came into naturally. Dark necromancy wasn't exactly a skill picked up on the streets, a la nicking apples and cutting purses. You had to want it, to strive for it, to practice on corpses both natural 
and not day in and day out to achieve the sort of effects worthy of the name. Yet, were she pressed, Lissa would claim, would protest that it hadn't been her choice. If anything, she'd been forced into it by the frog. Focus, her father declared to the Lissa and the other man, a scoundrel picked up some months ago withering away on the road to Hope's Hollow. Abandoned after a deadly mugging from some bandits, the man smelled like wine and spoke in mumbles only his dead Cretans could hear. The fire means there's still life down there. Her dad's gravelly sorrow made Lysa twitch more than the mosquitoes. Somehow, her father took every rotted corpse he rose to heart, as if the things were his children, were like Lisa. And when they inevitably fell apart, either to a warrior's axe or her father letting the spell lapse, the old man would sink into a funk. Sometimes he'd tell Lissa stories about this or that noble zombie, a skeleton worthy of remembrance. She forgot them all. Lissa, though, did not forget to focus as they descended. Her skeleton's bones and tibbets trailed the trio while her father's pair led. The scoundrel had yet to raise any fresh bones since his last corpses. A series of ill-fated squirrels had been snatched up by a swamp gutter. The hope, because around Hope's Hollow, one had to have hope, was that the scoundrel would find some fresh bodies here. Some loot, too. Necromancers had to eat, after all, and thievery could only take you so far out here. The man waiting in the mausoleum's centre wasn't what Lissa expected. She'd seen all manner of odd creatures, strange humans and stranger demons in her too few years among the cult, but not once had she witnessed a fool with a blade at a rope's end. The man's clothes held a rose tint beneath layers of guts and grime, any usefulness tarnished by holes throughout yet his face appeared set, his legs and arms in a stance that said, Battle. Father, Lissa said, I don't think we're unexpected. Her father's cowl shifted, a nod, and one that told his two bony friends to commence the assault. Negotiations with the soon-to-be-dead were pointless. Extracting information from a body was simple enough and guaranteed to be true. Yet, even as the skeletons advanced in their rattling fashion, Lissa looked to the right and left, counted four dark archways. With the zombies that had been here so obviously rendered to charnel ashes, what might be lurking therein? The scoundrel appeared to think the same, drawing a long dagger. He muttered something too, a sing-song phrase Lissa couldn't catch. Instead, she backed up a step, let Bones and Tibbet's close ranks before her. Keeping one's distance from ominous things seemed appropriate. Her father's two skeletons made it three steps before the mausoleum's own stone blocks rumbled, churned, and threw their spell-knit bones asunder. Rising up from the stones as if made manifest by them, stood a vaguely humanoid thing comprised of rock and rubble. Two golden moats shone deep in holes, marking what might have been eyes, a fascinating trait Lissa couldn't study more because the monster had commenced bashing her father's skeletons to shards. For an aged necromancer, Lissa's father moved fast. The man spoke some dark chant and threw his hands forward, a greenish-black gout emerging from those paired palms, to flood the stone creature. Pouring over like water, the gouting dark filled the creature's many crevasses and held it fast, a prison making it a prime target for the scoundrel's dagger if such a thing could be killed. Her father's magic, however, proved no antidote for the dagger appearing in his chest, nor the follow-up striking the man's shoulder. Two strikes Lissa saw only as her father spun back towards her, shock evident in the fixed features beneath his cowl. He collapsed. The scoundrel drove his dagger in at the rock monster, only for the blade to snap. The idiot human's knife tied to the end of that rope, did not. Like some knotted snake, the weapon curled its aim beneath the rock creature's frozen arm, striking the scoundrel in the leg and holding fast. With a yank, the scoundrel yelped, fell upon his backside, 
and was pulled towards the room's centre. All in all, a dismal start to the fight, and one Lissa had no desire to see continue. We're leaving, she said to her skeletons, and began to backpedal up the stairs. She managed a single step, one perfectly placed boot on stone stair, before searing heat washed over her, bones and tibbets. The two skeletons bore the flames with minimal impact, though their reflection as fire crawled over their bleached bones added another image to Lysa's prodigious nightmare supply. Lisa herself wasn't so immune. The flames catching her cloak and finding delicious threads to torch. Cursing, Lisa shrugged herself free, stumbled another step as bones and tibbets followed. She reached up, grasped the third stair with every intent to pull herself standing, only to see a thrown dagger bounce off the step near her hand. Please, please, stop running, said a merry voice. We don't want to kill all of you. Bones, Tibbets, buy me time, Lissa snapped to her dead assistants. The skeletons duly turned around, only to find their licking flames replaced by bone-busting ice. Their knobby joints filled with frigid flakes, the gaps growing until Lissa's dark enchantment failed, the bones rattling down the steps to a floor soaking in her father's, the scoundrel's blood. One more bad turn in a fight so far filled with them. As I said, the happy voice continued, we'd like to talk with you, cowled one. Lissa turned, sat on the step, and held her hands free. Retreat now would earn her a death more permanent than Lissa preferred. It'd also prevent her from raising her father again, and Lisa was nothing if not pragmatic. One had to be this far from relevant civilization. I yield, Lissa declared. Call off your monsters. Monsters, came the voice, its shape at last striding into view at the stair's bottom. Furred and with large ears, broad eyes like a cat, and fangs to match, the cackler was both a surprise and utterly expected by the necromancer, for it had been made clear to Lisa in too short a time that anything, everything, could happen in the fell domain around Hope's Hollow. These are hardly monsters, my cowled friend, though the Crimson Guardsman comes close, what with his absurd choice of weapon. Lisa raised a single eyebrow. Then peace. That's what I ask for, however you would deliver it. I would deliver it in the only way I know how, the cackler giggled, a skittering noise, with a deal, dark one, a very good deal. This is the end of Hope's Hollow Part 1. Keep a lookout for Part 2 soon, and for more adventures, check out blackkeybooks.com. Thanks for listening.